Good evening. Thank you all for coming. Um, it's a pleasure to um, introduce tonight's keynote speaker. I uh, want to thank um, Bill Roberts and Mari Lore and all of the WEP, WEP crew who have put together a, a really great program. And um, tonight um, we're going to hear from Jorge Cham, who is the creator of PhD Comics. And I don't know how many of you are regular readers or fans of his, his comics. I discovered his comics when I was a postdoc and um, have been a, an email subscriber. Ever, so ever, as soon as the email comes, I stop reading my students' manuscripts and I go look at the... <laughs> for those of you who are waiting for manuscript comments from me, uh, you can blame Jorge because he just published a new comic last night, uh, despite being here in the middle of web. So, um, Anyway, uh, Jorge has a, a background in science. He um, has an undergraduate degree from Georgia Tech. Um, and then he did a PhD in mechanical engineering at Stanford. After finishing the PhD at Stanford, he began working at uh, Caltech. And uh, yesterday I said to him, you know, we, we stole the president from Caltech, who before Caltech was at Georgia Tech. It was a very interesting coincidence. And uh, Jorge said, I heard we gave him away. <laughs> oh, I can say that because I know that uh, President Shimo is not able to be here with us tonight, so just so, just so you're aware. Um, Jorge uh, will, uh, I think, maybe talk a little bit about some of his science background. But um, what's more relevant for tonight is that while he was doing his PhD at Stanford, he began uh, drawing the comic strip, which has now piled higher and deeper comics and PhD comics. And so he has a lot of experience in uh, the life that you or your family, if you're a family member of a, of a Cal scientist, uh, I think we'll all relate very much to some of the um, experiences that he is going to share with us, and I think you'll appreciate where he's coming from. But uh, it, it, I think sometimes he, um, he may kind of try to come off as uh, having left science, but he is not telling you the whole story because he's really moved. The comic is not just a comic anymore, and... Now they actually, uh, he and his, his fairly small team, it's very impressive what they can pull off with such a small group, but they do a lot of features where they'll um, make a short video about somebody's research, or it, he used to draw some comics about some people's research. And what I think is really excites me about his work is that he communicates science in a way that very few people achieve. So as he you know, may say, there are not very many cartoonists with a PhD in engineering, and I think that that's a very true statement. So he has a really unique position of understanding science, academic life, and he's an excellent communicator and an excellent artist. So I think that you'll enjoy seeing him bring to life some of what we live and experience all the time. So. In addition to um, communicating through PhD Comics and the video series, he also has a regular column in Scientific American and has published you know, um, illustrations. I don't really think it's fair to call them cartoons all the time. They're really sometimes it's illustration of science communication. And so um, now Jorge is not really kind of a formal introduction kind of guy. And so I'm going to leave it at that. And please, let's give a very warm Kaus welcome to Jorge Cham. Thanks. Thank you. Hey. How's it going? <laughs> that did not sound very good, you guys. Uh, I'll try it again. How's it going? <laughs> yeah, not much better. But uh, first of all, I want to thank Mike for introducing me and inviting me here today, and the web program, and Mary Lore for uh, bringing me here today um, and organizing this great program for you guys. Let's give them a quick round of applause, please. Yeah.
Uh, but really, I want to thank all of you for coming to this lecture tonight. I know that it's Wednesday night, it's 7 p.m. I'm sure at this time, most of you would much rather be, you know, at work, <laughs> in the lab, working hard, starting your work day. But instead, you're here to procrastinate with us. So thank you, thank you for coming here. Well, let me get a sense of who's here. How many of you here are postgraduate or graduate students? Raise your hand. Nice, great. Uh, do we have any faculty or professors in the room here tonight? <laughs> Four or five, not bad. Thank you for raising your hands. That's very brave of you. Uh, security, can we now... Um... <laughs> Get him out of here. And I uh, would also ask about postdocs. But I think they're used to being ignored. So why bother? <laughs> no, but it's a great honor for me to be here at Cows. You know, I've heard of Cows, the uh, famous Cows University, uh, for a long time. I think I first heard about it like 10 years ago, something like that. Uh, but no, I am honored to be here. Thank you very much. And uh, today, I'm just going to talk a little bit about kind of my story, what happened to me while I was getting uh, my PhD, like maybe a lot of you here today. Uh, sort of my time in academia. Uh, and so the story for me starts that, uh, when I was a graduate student at Stanford University, as Mike said, where my research focused on making these small robots that could run like cockroaches. So here's a quick movie of what these robots look like. Yeah, so I like to show this movie for uh, two reasons. First of all, I feel like this movie really, it really kind of represents what getting a PhD feels like. <laughs> I'm sure most of you here and now tonight know the feeling you feel like you're running the whole time, but you're not getting anywhere. <laughs> Meanwhile, there's a more intelligent being stamping you down. But I also like to show this movie for another important reason, which is that um, it's kind of the only way, showing this video here is the only way I can get anyone to look at my research <laughs> anymore these days. Because, you know, it's going to become very clear to me that by far more popular than the research I spend years working on as part of my actual career, by far more popular has been what I was doing when I should have been doing research when I was procrastinating, which was to make these comic strips called Piled Higher and Deeper. And so how it all started for me was that I saw this advertisement in the student newspaper there at Stanford asking, asking students for comics ideas. And I remember thinking at the time that, you know, there are, there are a lot of stories about being a graduate student and being a master's student, being a PhD student, being an academic. A lot of stories that you really don't hear anywhere else, right? And, popular culture and movies and TV shows, it's always about, you know, it's always about cops and detectives and all the dramas. They're always about uh, uh, lawyers, right, and, and doctors and, and uh, um, I mean, the real doctors, <laughs> the ones that are actually helpful. Uh, but you never see anything about kind of graduate students, right? And so I asked myself the question at the time, who is this strange creature called the graduate student? What's going on inside of their complex and complicated mind? And it turned out that apparently... <laughs> apparently it's not that complicated. 
And I mean that in the sense that, you know, most of the graduate students that I knew in graduate school weren't these kind of crazy, eccentric, kind of weird, weird social stereotypes that you see portrayed in popular culture, you know, whenever they try to feature a scientist or an academic or just anyone who happens to be smart, they always resort to these kind of stereotypes and caricatures of, of smart people. <laughs> Big Bang Theory. But, you know, most of the people that I knew in graduate school were really just kind of normal people, right? Regular people. You know, we were mostly just concerned with surviving graduate school more than anything else. And so that's kind of what the comics became about. They became about surviving those one-on-one -on -one meetings with your professors, where you feel about this big sitting in front of them, surviving the ensuing begging that you have to do. It's like, you don't have to pay me. Can I please do work for you? Actually, the lab for needs a good mopping. Uh, surviving being a teaching assistant. You know, not having to deal with those annoying undergrads, which I can say because I know there aren't any here. Are there any undergrads in the room here today? <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> no offense to the 10 of you here today. Uh, yeah, surviving, uh, being a teaching assistant, having to teach courses or assist teaching courses, late night project sessions as well. Uh, learning about grad student etiquette. It's a word of advice to those of you not in academia here tonight, never ask a graduate student how their research is going. Uh, let's see, what else? Surviving those uh, oral examinations. Good times. And then eventually other characters started to appear in the comic strip. It wasn't just sort of about me. There was uh, other characters that started to appear, like Cecilia, one of the brave 5 to 10 percent of women in some fields, like uh, electrical engineering or physics or computer science, who I think, like a lot of us here tonight, you do kind of at some point have to admit you are sort of kind of a geek. Then we had the uh, token humanities student, Tejo, who was always protesting something. And then, of course, we had that guy, that guy that everybody seems to have in their department, in any academic department, that guy that's been there longer than anyone can remember, Mike Slackenerny. Mike, whose, uh, whose job it is, as the oldest graduate student, to, is to educate the new students in the way of the PhD. So exactly, money, a social life, a shave, a PhD student needs not such things. Yeah. So that was actually said to me my first year by this older student called Mike. So I don't make a lot of this stuff up. It's all nonfiction. And then like Mike, uh, like many, maybe a lot of us uh, here today, or a lot of you here today, you not only have to, you find yourself, you not only have to manage your professors and their expectations of you, but you also kind of have to manage your significant others and their expectations of you. And so I kept drawing these comments for, kind of for the student newspaper there. And I think people sort of responded to them there. People sort of liked them, not just because maybe they could identify with the characters or identify with the situations that I, that I showed in the comics. I think people kind of responded or connected with the comics because the subtext of the comics, you know, the underlying theme of the comics, was always about asking the real question about graduate school, about academia. The big question, which is, why? <laughs> Why do we go all through all of that, right? Voluntarily. Because, you know, I'm pretty sure that nobody, whoever goes into academia, really does it for the money. So this is a survey at the time um, 
that I was curious, I looked up how much they pay teaching assistants and research assistants over all these disciplines, over all these schools in the United States. And it's kind of interesting. Um, I know it's a little bit lower than what you're used to here at Calst. Right, everyone gets a Porsche and their own airplane. But in the US, at least at the time, you know, if you took all these figures and you took the average of them, you get a figure equal to $14,055. As a kind of general idea, it gave me a general idea of what kind of how much they value graduate students, at least at the time in the US. And I thought, hey, $14,055, that's not, that's not too bad. I mean, you could probably survive on this, right? If you eat at McDonald's every day. But to put it into perspective, let's compare this figure now to what you would be earning if you worked at McDonald's. <laughs> earning minimum wage in California, how much they make a year, that turns out to be Should I stop here? Should I? <laughs> All right, thank you very much. It's been a, that figure. <laughs> thank you for trying. <laughs> I, I appreciate that. I know you want me out of here. Uh, that figure turns out to be, if you worked at McDonald's for minimum wage in California, that figure turns out to be, yes. $15 less. Yeah. That's right. I'm loving it. <laughs> but then a few years ago, I was like, oh, I wonder what that figure is nowadays. And it turns out that if you look it up now and you take that average, you get now something like $18,779, um, which is uh, better, you know, considering inflation and all of that. Until you compare that to what, how much the U.S. government will pay you if you're unemployed, doing nothing, that figure turns out to be which conclusively proves it pays more to do nothing than it, did, than it does to do whatever it is that you're doing right now. Uh, so that didn't quite make a lot of sense, but you know, at the time I didn't really think about it that much. But, and what I did was I, was I took my procrastination to the next level. And I started putting these comic strips out on a free web server on campus, and on the ones in the newspaper I would just put the web address in the bottom right corner. And so I think what happened very organically was that people who read it there and liked it would then tell their friends about it, and then those people then tell their friends who they went to undergrad with and who now went to other graduate schools. And then those people then tell their lab mates and their friends, and then those people then tell uh, their friends in other universities. And so slowly over the years, kind of like a, like a Ponzi scheme, <laughs> these comics kind of went out into the world. And it was actually, you know, very interesting. It was very interesting for me to find out that these comics that I was, these stories that I was writing about, apparently weren't just happening at Stanford University. Oh no, apparently, Apparently, it's a global misery phenomenon. <laughs> uh, so that's a list of all the universities of the, of the people who subscribed to the website up until a few years ago, just to kind of give you a sense of who's reading these comics. And it was also very interesting to find out that it wasn't just limited to engineering or the sciences, which is where I was coming from. People from all kinds of disciplines were reading these comics. So this is a list of all those people's majors, just going from about A to about C. And these are kind of uh, interesting. I'm not going to scroll them because they're kind of interesting to see like art history grad students are reading this and brain and cognitive sciences are reading this and uh, chemistry. <laughs> 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 
apparently spelling is not a requirement in chemistry. <laughs> um, but yeah, so that was really interesting. I was like, wow, all these people. And then what was even more interesting was that I started, I started to hear back from all these people across the world, across all these different uh, disciplines. And I can roughly categorize the emails I get into these four types of emails. So, um, you know, I wake up in the morning, I check my email, and I usually get something that goes like, oh, God. I break down and cry and there's a new comic. I don't know whether to laugh or cry. And so that really makes me feel good. <laughs> Making thousands of people weep. Yeah. You're welcome. Uh, well, people also thank me for making the comics. They say, hey, Jorge, thank you for making the comics. Uh, I was supposed to be working. But instead, I just spent days surfing your website. And so that also makes me feel good. <laughs> I'm pretty sure by now, somewhere in the world, you know, there's probably some lab somewhere, some grad student about to make an incredible discovery for humankind. And they're about to make it when suddenly their lab mate goes, hey, have you checked out this website? Humanity took a step backwards, thanks to me. Yeah. You're welcome. Uh, then I get a third type of comment, which usually goes something like, <laughs> Cecilia, your character is so hot. Can I marry her? And so this type of comment really, um, disturbs me, <laughs> right? Because first of all, she's an imaginary cartoon character. And second of all, right, she's my imaginary girlfriend. <laughs> so back off. <laughs> That's right, make up your own imaginary girlfriends. Yeah, back off. She's also the mother of my imaginary children. She's, um, that went too far. <laughs> but, you know, um, I also get a fourth type of comment through the website, which usually goes something like, you make me feel less alone. Your comic is probably responsible for keeping many of us sane. And so when I get this type of comment, I usually go, aw. You know, it makes me think that maybe, just maybe, this isn't just all a huge waste of time for humankind. You know, maybe it's just kind of a medium-sized waste of time. Because, <laughs> you know, I was reading um, the survey they did at the University of California at Berkeley, where they sent a questionnaire to all the grad students asking about their mental health. And I see there's already people laughing just because I said grad students and mental health <laughs> in the same sentence. But what they found in this survey, this is um, pretty interesting, they found, first of all, in the survey that 95%, 95%, 95% of all graduate students at some point report feeling overwhelmed or overstressed about their workload, about their life, about their careers, 95%, right? That's incredible, right? Hard to believe, right? Because who are these other 5%? <laughs> Why are they lying? <laughs> Actually, I figured out, maybe they're um, chemistry majors. Maybe they're... <laughs> they couldn't spell, they just checked whatever was in the survey. Um, but a little bit more serious, they also found in this uh, mental health report, they also found that 67% uh, of them, two out of every three graduate students, at some point report uh, having felt hopeless or depressed about their academic careers, about their lives, etc. And so this, um, this one is a little bit more serious because, um, you know, hopelessness and depression, they're really not things that we should take too lightly.
Okay, that's a little uncomfortable, you guys. No, yeah, you know, shouldn't take it too lightly. And so that's why I'm here today, to tell all of you guys that there is an alternative to hopelessness and depression. There is an alternative. There is a third way, which is the way of procrastination. That's right, procrastination. And I know what a lot of you might be thinking right now, which is procrastination. But that's a bad thing, Jorge, right? Sex, drugs, procrastination. The Saudi government does not allow me to do anything. <laughs> I mean, your mother, your mother does not allow you to do these things. They're bad, right? But in fact, I think procrastination just gets a bad rap. It gets a bad reputation. I think it gets a bad reputation because people often confuse procrastination with its very close cousin, its very close relative, which is laziness. But I actually argue that procrastination and laziness are not the same thing. They're not the same thing, right? I mean, laziness, that's kind of when you don't want to do anything. Procrastination, you just don't want to do it now. I'll let you think about that for a second. It's not the same thing, procrastination and laziness. And in fact, if you look it up in the dictionary, all it says is that it's to postpone or delay needlessly, which kind of sounds like a negative thing. But I think it actually gives us a loophole. Because if you can find the need for it, maybe it's not so bad. <laughs> and in fact, I think there are many examples throughout history where procrastination, procrastination has worked out for the best. So here's a little bit more of my research. Um, looking at famous procrastinators in history, going all the way back to Isaac Newton. Yes, Isaac Newton, and the story of how the apple fell on him, you know, I think the real question here is, what was he doing under that tree? <laughs> you know, he wasn't in the lab working, was he? And there's a story of uh, Albert Einstein. You know, I bet Einstein's mother would have loved for him to have worked hard at the patent office where he had his real job, and you know, made his way up to middle management just like he was supposed to do for his actual career. But instead, Albert Einstein spent a lot of time working on physics equations, you know, kind of on the side, which, um, you know, kind of worked out for Albert there, <laughs> relatively speaking. <laughs> I apologize for that one. But yeah, I said it worked out for him. Uh, there's also the story of the famous science fiction writer, Isaac Asimov. I don't know how many of you know this, but, know this, but Asimov uh, took 10 years, it took him 10 years to finish his PhD in chemistry. Chemistry. <laughs> chemistry. 10 years, it took him 10 years at Columbia University to finish his uh, PhD. So in fact, that's a picture of Asimov before getting his PhD. Here's what he looked like after the PhD. <laughs> Before, after. Uh, and in fact, later on in his life, Asimov, he wrote in his memoir, in his autobiography, that when he was a graduate student, his advisor actually told him, his supervisor, his professor, actually told him to his face that he was a bad writer, that he didn't know how to write well at all. And so despite that, he spent a lot of time working on, you know, what turned out to be some of the most amazing science fiction novels of the century. Now, a few more modern heroes of procrastination are the Yahoo and the Google guys. Is there anyone in the room here today who does not use Yahoo or Google for your research? 
Yeah, in fact, legend has it that, um, so actually both these companies were started by graduate students. And in fact, legend has it that uh, Jerry Yang and David Filo's advisor just happened to go on sabbatical. Went on sabbatical, and so Jerry Yang said to David Filo, hey, our professor's not here right now. Why don't we try to categorize the entire internet? before he comes back. <laughs> that is some legendary procrastination right there. But you know, I think there's also real science that makes the case for procrastination. For example, there's the work by the cognitive psychologist Teresa Amabile, who found through experiments, experiments that things she calls extrinsic motivators, you know, outside pressures when somebody's telling you that you need to do something, that you have to do something because um, there's a competition, or there's a contest, or there's going to be a reward or even an L word at the end, it actually tends to make people, excuse me, feel more constrained and tends to make people feel more controlled and tends to decrease their creative thinking. A little bit more recently and more high tech is they started looking at people's brain activity while trying to come up with problems that require insight. And so their hypothesis here is that when you're trying to come up with insightful kind of novel uh, solutions to open-ended problems, what you're trying to do in your head is you're trying to put together concepts concepts within your brain that are not already obviously connected to each other. And so for that, they hypothesize that you need this kind of low-grade, almost unconscious brain activity so that if you actually think about it too much or you focus on the problem too hard, you can actually suppress this important connection making. Yeah, that's right. I have references in my slides with like et al and everything. Look at that. <laughs> yeah, all this scientific uh, support for procrastination and all this historical anecdotes that make a case for procrastination. Still, right, procrastination kind of has kind of a negative stigma about it, right, in society and especially in academia. And so then I ask myself the question, you know, why is that, you know? What's really the problem? with procrastination. And so I thought about this question for a long time. <laughs> Perhaps too long. But I thought about this question for a long time, and um, it occurred to me that I think the, that the answer to this question maybe has something to do with this very typical conversation that I kind of always find myself having with graduate students, no matter where I go, anywhere in the world, this conversation usually goes something like this. You go up to a group of graduate students, and you say to them, hey, how's it going? And they usually respond with the same enthusiasm you guys respond with earlier, something along the lines of, oh, God, I am so stressed. I'm trying to graduate. All these things I have to do. I've only been sleeping three hours a night. And so you go, whoa, three hours a night? That's crazy. That's insane. Really? Man, three hours a night, I mean, that's crazy, right? That must mean that you're doing research. Uh... <laughs> 21 hours a day? And they usually respond, uh, no. Uh, no, I went out, I watched TV, and I'm organizing this event for the campus underwater basketball and pick your favorite obscure hobby here at club because I'm the club president. And so you go, oh. <laughs> and then they go, but I should be doing research. <laughs> I'm supposed to be working right now. And so I thought, aha, you know. The real problem with procrastination is not really that there aren't enough hours in the week to do all your work and pursue, pursue all your hobbies and your interests. The real problem with procrastination seems to be all about guilt.
I always get a nice, uncomfortable silence here. <laughs> Everyone's going, ha, hmm. Guilt, right? Because the thing about academia, as you may have figured out, the thing about it is that it sort of never ends, right? There's always something else in academia that you should be doing, that you're supposed to be doing at any given time of the day. There's always more papers you could be reading, more references you could be looking at, more funding you could be applying for, more experiments you could be running, more, more data analysis you could be doing, more talks you could be getting, more equipment you could be putting together. Whereas I think maybe people with regular jobs, you know, regular nine to five jobs, I think it's maybe a little easier for them to just leave everything at the office at the end of the day and then just go home and relax, right? In academia, there's this kind of constant anxiety of always feeling like there's something else that you should be doing, that you're supposed to be doing, that you could be doing. And yet you find yourself a lot of the time, basically, <laughs> basically not doing these things, right? And so I think that's one of the reasons a lot of people kind of burn out a little bit early in their academic careers. And so then I ask myself the question, you know, why is that, you know? Why do we have that constant struggle? Why do we feel like if we have all these things that we should be doing, that we're supposed to be doing, why can we just do them? Why can't we just do the things we're supposed to do instead of doing other things? And then you feel guilty and depressed about them to the point sometimes where you don't even enjoy the things you used to enjoy before. Well, I thought about this question also for a long time. And I think that maybe, just maybe, in this case, the answer to this question maybe has something to do with the fact that <laughs> the fact that we just don't want to do them. You see, this is all related to my grand theory of procrastination, which uh, is related to what I called in early comic strips the Newton's, oh, <laughs> what? which is related to what I call uh, my theory of procrastination, the unified theory of procrastination in academia. <laughs> which must be correct, right? Because it has such an awesome acronym. But this uh, theory of mine kind of goes back to what I called in early comics, the uh, Newton's laws of graduation. So if you're already familiar with these uh, from uh, the books, the comics, or if you've heard the talk before, bear with me for a second. But these laws of graduation say, say that, the first law says that, a grad student in procrastination tend to stay in procrastination unless an external force, external force is applied to them. This is formalized more and the second law of graduation, which says that the HA of a doctoral or master's thesis process is directly proportional to the flexibility F given by the advisor and inversely proportional to the student's motivation M. Which we can write as an equation as H of the thesis equals the amount of flexibility divided by the amount of motivation, which we can abbreviate as A equals F over M, which we can rewrite as F equals MA. Everybody knows you can't argue with F equals MA. I want to thank you guys also for laughing at this joke. One time I gave this talk to a group of arts and social scientists. Dead silence. Um, yeah, if you can't argue with F equals MA, right? Unless, of course, you're moving at close to the speed of light, which, let's face it, never happens in graduate school. <laughs> but yeah, let's explore now this equation in more detail. And let's start with this bottom term down here, motivation, right? Because I think everybody comes to graduate school Well, let's face it, most people go into, the, into it because it seems better than getting a real job. 
But still, you get kind of excited about it, right? You come with high expectations. You come here eager to learn, eager to make a difference in this world with your research. And so you take that next step in your life, and you turn that corner, ready to face the challenges of graduate school. Except it turns out graduate school is more like <laughs> down here. Or, you know, if you were to plot this kind of complex psychological phenomenon that happens to a lot of graduate students in their first year of graduate school, if you were to plot it in the motivatometer, you see that motivation starts off pretty high, but then quickly the first year, it all comes crashing down. And, you know, I think it all comes crashing down uh, for a couple of reasons for a lot of people. First of all, you have to get used to being average. Maybe before in undergrad, you were one of the best students. You were, at, you know, one of the best students in your class, maybe. You were at the top of your class, maybe even the valedictorian. But then you get to graduate school. There's not a lot of room up there. Also, I think what happens is grad school actually makes you dumber. Contrary to what was advertised to you when you looked at the brochures. Because, you know, I think what happens is before graduate school, right, you're fresh out of college, you feel pretty good about yourself, because the ratio between what you think you know and what you think you don't know is pretty high, so you feel good. But then you get to grad school, <laughs> and you already forgot most of what you learned. But you also learn how much you don't know, right? Because suddenly you're surrounded by all these experts in their fields and all these really brilliant people. And so then what happens to a lot of people is they start to compare themselves. <laughs> yeah, you know who I'm talking about here. The person in your lab or your group that just seems to work all the time, just cranks out all those papers, gets all the results, makes you want to just... <laughs> okay, that laugh was a little too maniacal, I think. No, you shouldn't, you shouldn't, you should not, um, you should not harm your fellow students. Trust me. Uh, yeah, a lot of people start to compare themselves, you know, to their peers, to their advisor, to their professors, and they end up feeling like an imposter. So it's actually a very kind of well-known, well-documented thing that happens in academia called imposter syndrome, which is when you think that maybe the only reason you got into graduate school was a clerical mistake. <laughs> you know, you feel like you, uh, you're not as smart as everybody else, that you're just uh, not as good as everybody else, that you're somehow fooling people that you just don't belong. Still, you, um, you hang in there, and maybe you get excited about the research project that you picked for your thesis, or the research project that was picked for you. But you get very excited about it, right, because it's kind of interesting and it's kind of cool, until you realize it's also impossible. and somebody already did it. <laughs> you get motivated about your qualifying exams or your finals, then you actually pass. It's like you can't even get out of bed anymore. Still, you hang in there. You hang in there and you claw your way up the motivation chart little by little. Until that one day, you know, that one day in grad school, when you get that phone call, you know that phone call from your friend? You know which friend, right? The one that didn't go to grad school? They call you and they're like, hey, how's it going? Still in grad school, huh? Well, let me tell you about my sweet life. We have these great jobs. We have this family. We just had a baby, a real baby. <laughs> a 
all the pictures are on Facebook, which is kind of weird because their profile picture is a baby. <laughs> They're like, yeah, we just, um, we have these, uh, we drive these nice cars, we just bought a house. And you're like, you can buy houses? <laughs> yeah, we have these, uh, this great life, and meanwhile you're on the other line, all by yourself. Still in the lab. Late at night eating ramen noodles in the middle of the desert. <laughs> that's kind of when things start to look very scary for a lot of graduate students, because that's kind of when fear sets in. Fear, I think, of a couple of things. First of all, fear of failure. You know, I think a lot of us who do make it this far do tend to be the kind of overachieving or type A personalities. And so we have a lot investing in ourselves, in our achievements, in our accomplishments. So a lot of times we have a hard time admitting to ourselves when it's better to keep moving on. Except the problem is you also get fear of moving on. Right? Because, you know, grad school can be a relatively comfortable place, right? Relatively speaking. You know, you can walk into your lab at 10 a.m., right? 11 a.m., noon. Let's see if this works. How many of you here today are just now getting in, haven't even been to your office today? One guy in the back. <laughs> bravo, sir, bravo. Yeah, a lot of people kind of hesitate because they're actually afraid of what will happen to them if they get out of grad school, right? If they graduate, right? Because then you have to decide what you want to be when you grow up. <laughs> right? If you graduate, you have to go out there beyond the walls of academia. In this case, the literal walls <laughs> of the university. You know, beyond out there, you, you kind of get afraid of what will happen to you in the real world, right? It's kind of like what happens to prison inmates. So you sort of get afraid of, uh, of graduating. And so a lot of people kind of freak out and they end up procrastinating a lot. And so my message to you guys here today and the message that I always give graduate students and academics everywhere or anyone in general is that it's okay. It's okay because, you know, a very significant uh, point for me in my graduate career was to take a class from this professor called Bernie Roth. And Bernie Roth is this uh, world-famous, world-renowned authority and expert, and researcher, famous guy in robotics and kinematics. Perhaps um, nobody has ever heard of him here. But Bernie Ross is also this kind of groovy 70s kind of dude. And so he would always challenge his class, just like I'm going to ask you guys here tonight. He would always challenge us by asking what I'm going to ask you guys here right now, which is to tell me what are some of the things in life that you have to do? What are some of the things? Let's start with that. What are the things you have to do? <laughs> Pay bills. <laughs> die. Nice one, sir. There's always a wise guy. I said, in life, in life, in life. You have to pay your bills, you have to get a job, you have to graduate, you have to um, get a job. Did I say that already? You have to pay taxes, right? You have to eat, you have to sleep, you have to breathe. That's what usually what people say in these uh, situations. But, you know, Bernie's point was that he would say, you know what, in life, there's really actually nothing that you have to do, you know? People use that kind of language all the time, like, hey, I have to go to work, I have to finish this paper, I have to publish this, I have to finish this experiment. Um, but really, it's just kind of the language they use. Nobody's really actually making you do any of these things, not even to eat, not even to sleep, not even to pay your bills. Everything you do, he would say, everything you do, you do it because you want to do it. And so I thought, whoa, huh, if that's true, 
then I say that procrastination is what you do when you're doing what you want to be doing. Right? If everything you do, you do it because you want to do it, then even procrastination has that kind of equal value, and so it's a good thing, right? Just ignore the logical fallacies in that statement. <laughs> Nod and smile. Because, you know, the main point of this is to maybe just relax a little bit. Enjoy it. And listen to your inner procrastinator. Now, you might be thinking, Jorge, that's great. But what if I never graduate? <laughs> How does that help me get out of here? Well, fortunately for all of us, for everybody, there are other terms in the equation. So small as the bottom term here may get for you, inevitably the upper term up here <laughs> will get even smaller. Basically, inevitably, what always happens is that the final impetus, the final decision to graduate is essentially made for you. <laughs> Inevitably, what happens is you run out of time, you run out of money, you run out of funding, you're uh, suddenly expecting a baby or your significant other moves to another city or country or, or, um, or, um, or continent. Uh, or you find a job that you really, really want, and so all of a sudden, you're, most people are faced with a deadline they will not want to miss. Um, because one of the things I notice about people with PhDs is that nobody's ever really happy with their thesis. So if you ask anyone with a PhD, even your professors, even the postdocs in your group, if you ask them if they were 100%, 100% happy with the final product they turned in at the end, most likely, I would bet, they'll tell you, uh, not 100%. You know, most likely they'll tell you they ran out of time, they ran out of mind, they had just to grab every kind of project they had done together, anything they could get their hands on, <laughs> slapped it all together into this one document, checked that all the margins were the right. <laughs> and they just shoved it out the door. Because the other thing I noticed about grad school and graduate students is that, you know, if you look at anyone who's famous in your fields of research, any of the big names, any of the world-famous renowned experts, if you look at the actual work they're famous for, most likely, I would bet again, they're not famous for the work they did as graduate students. They're more famous for the work they did as professors. Which is kind of scary, but it's true, right? It's probably for the work they did as professors, because, you know, then they had grad students do the work for them. So at some point, all of these things kind of come together in your head and you ramp up the motivation chart and maybe you get to the point where you defend your thesis or at least write the outline for your thesis. <laughs> but then it gets a little bit bumpy, which I don't have time to cover here today. I'll leave that for my future work. <laughs> if you know what I mean. But I will sort of leave you with uh, another big piece of advice. I always like to with grad students, because, you know, I, myself included, I see a lot of grad students who kind of form this image in their heads of their professors as these omnipotent beings judging them, <laughs> looking down upon them and judging your every word, every move. And so people really stress out about that. And so I always like to tell people that, you know what, you can relax a little bit. Because, you know what, your professor will probably, probably, probably doesn't think you're an idiot, right? Because the fact is, he or she really, uh... <laughs> they really don't think about you that much. And so just to kind of wrap up here, I feel like I always have to have this slide at the end of my presentations. Because I do feel like people see the comics and they see these talks and they kind of feel like, they get the impression that I have maybe a very cynical, uh, cynical opinion or a cynical 
impression of academia and graduate school and the PhD. But I always like to tell people that, no, you know, I'm really glad, actually, personally, that I'm really glad that I went into it. I'm really glad that I stuck with it and was able to finish the degree. Because I do feel like in the process, you do gain a lot of very important skills, very important transferable skills that will carry you not just in academia, but beyond into whatever career you guys choose for yourselves. Very important skills, starting with, first of all, <laughs> you get pretty good at PowerPoint presentations. Second most important skill I learned in graduate school was how to write bullet item lists. But the most important thing I learned in graduate school was how to give a one-hour presentation. On any topic. Even procrastination. <laughs> now, I joke around with this list, but I'm actually serious about this. By this, I mean that in grad school, you sort of learn the ability to teach yourself anything technical that you need to learn for your research, you know, to become a self-learner, self-motivated learner. You learn the ability to think analytically and be able to break things down into its components. And you also kind of learn the ability to, at the same time, keep in mind the big picture of things and then be able to communicate that to other people. I know you're speechless now. Because <laughs> I had a moral to the story. So I'll leave you guys with the words of Mike Slack and Ernie, who said, grad school is a state of mind. <laughs> and which state would that be? Preferably sleeping, which you're interrupting, now go away. So thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Jorge. That was a great talk. Um, as a token of our appreciation for you making the trip all the way out here, we have a small gift for you. Oh, thank you. We hope you remember Kaust and yeah. your time here with Oh, Rep. it is oil. <laughs> <laughs> I promised him oil yesterday. Uh, I think that we have uh, some time and some microphones around. If anybody would like to ask um, some questions, I'm sure Jorge would be happy to, to answer some questions. One here. First of all, thank you for the great presentation. And just a quick question, how long did it take you to get that uh, awesome acronym for the law? The acronym, Utopia, how long did it take you to get it? How long did it take me to come up with the acronym for Utopia? That, is that one? That's yes. what you mean? Yes, exactly. Uh, the Unified Theory of, of Procrastination in Academia. Yeah. Uh, I actually um, had a grad student come up with that for me. <laughs> That's a true story. <laughs> He's the corresponding author on that one. Why, did, it, did I make it seem like I came up with it? Is that... <laughs> Any other questions? One towards the back. Um, I used to read your, your comics. Uh, where, did you, where did you find the inspiration for your characters? I mean, like the professor, for example. Is that a real life image of somebody that you knew of as a professor, or did you meet this professor anywhere else? Uh, no. Just, Next question. <laughs> no, no, no. Nobody in the comic strip was, uh, is based on anyone in real life. It's not based on anyone I may have worked for <laughs> or dated or known in grad school. But, yeah. 
Um, so how did you stay committed to uh, working on the comic? Because um, a lot of people could like start these art projects and like comics and then they just kind of like, they just die out. So how did you just like keep working on it for so long? Um, yeah, that's a good question. Well, the, the main answer is that I, I would procrastinate doing research by making the comics. And then I would procrastinate making the comics by doing research. <laughs> and so if you set yourself up that way, you can actually stay pretty productive. But you know what happened, because um, that's, that's actually a very good question. What happened was that I, because I had started doing it for the newspaper initially, um, you know, I had a deadline, there were people expecting me to do it, there was an audience uh, already sort of reading it. And so, you know, if, if I have a recommendation for something that, like that that you want to try, is, is to kind of commit yourself to the point of, of reason, on reason, on reason. Beyond, the point, be, beyond the point of reason, sort of commit yourself to, to something like that, like promise, promise that you're going to do it or, or have that your work sort of shown somewhere or something like that, and then that sort of helps motivate. That gives you the flexibility that, that shrinks down. The question here in the middle. Hi, thanks for your talk. Um, I have a question regarding your choice of career. Uh, coming out of graduate school. So do my parents. Yeah. <laughs> Tiger mom, huh? <laughs> Tiger mom. Uh, the, the thing is, coming out of graduate school, I mean, you obviously have this thing conditioned in your head that, you know, the next step is a postdoc and then a professorship or, or permanent position somewhere or whatever. But then you chose a very unconventional career path. And it's, it's really a leap of faith to jump into a career path which was your hobby. Uh, how did you prepare yourself mentally to get into that sort of uh, mindset or that career path? Thank you. Well, that's like a deep question. <laughs> like I should be sitting down on a couch or something. <laughs> um, so uh, people ask me that sometimes too. It's like how was I able to kind of leave the, my career path behind? And, um, and so what actually sort of happened for me was that I was, you know, I kept doing these. So I, I did it for the newspaper for a while, but even then that sort of wasn't enough to kind of keep me motivated. Uh, but then I sort of took this class with Bernie Roth, and you know, I sort of realized that I really enjoyed making these comic strips. They made me happy when I made them, and so they, I should make a priority for them in my life and, 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 and um, not have any excuse for not doing them, right? Because everything you do, you do because you want to do it. And so that sort of kept me going uh, for a long time. Even as I graduated with my PhD, I was a research, I was like a postdoc kind of adjunct faculty at Caltech. And so I kept making these. And so slowly over the years, I sort of saw my academic uh, degree half-life kind of start to decay. <laughs> and at the same time, I sort of saw the traffic for this comic strip kind of start to increase. And so I just at some point switched curves. Uh, but it, it was kind of a, a leap of faith. Um, you know, I had to kind of shed a lot of kind of the ego and everything I had invested in myself and what I had told people that I was going to do this and that and just kind of not stop caring about, you know, degrees and prestige and things like that and, and, and come to terms with the fact that um, if I do this, I might at some point find myself being 60-something years old and working at McDonald's, earning as much as I was at the moment. <laughs> But you know, you sort of come to well, once you sort of realize how much how important it is for you, you come to terms with that and, and you do it. Yeah. Another question here. Yeah, um, I have a friend that uh, is doing a PhD in history, and she is spending tons of time writing historical comic strips. And I told her basically she should graduate. <laughs> what What would you say? You told her she should graduate. Yeah, she should. she should do something. Did she not hear anything <laughs> I said? Did, this, did I just? <laughs> is this all? <laughs> no, you know, I, I know what I would, um, you know, if, she, if she's happy doing it, you know, why not, right? As long as her flexibility doesn't shrink down to zero, she's, and it makes her happy, why not? There's nothing that you should do, basically. Uh, 
I got really deep. Another question towards the front. What are my future plans? Like, what am I doing with my life? <laughs> like, how's my research going? Okay, that's it. I give up. No, you know, I don't really um, have that many <laughs> future plans. You know, I'm just going to keep doing this until I can't do it anymore, and then, uh, and then we'll see, you know? Um, yeah, so they, we made a movie out of the comic strips. What else do you want? <laughs> musical tour. Musical Broadway show. Broadway show. Grad school the musical. <laughs> Still in grad school. No, you know, I don't, uh, I don't really uh, make plans that far ahead in advance, you know. One of the things I, one of the other things I always, I've also always noticed about people with PhDs that very few people end up doing five years after their PhD. Very few people end up doing the same thing they're actually doing right now at the moment. You know, every five years, most people are doing something different wherever they are. So you know. What was the purpose for the cockroach robots? You guys are brutal. Security. <laughs> Security. I'll take the lashes instead. Yep. What was the purpose? <laughs> you mean, what was the real purpose, or what, what, was, what did we put in the grant? Is that what you. Uh, no, they were funded as like robots that you could send into places that are hard to get to by humans, like other planets or like uh, mine, if minefields or disaster areas, you could send cockroach robots and they would find people or mines and things like that. Yeah. But mostly it was just to get me my PhD. <laughs> In fact, somebody, um, after I left, somebody, one of the students tried to look into making it into a toy. Like, could we turn these robots into toys? And it turned out that the uh, design was too impractical even for a toy. <laughs> Another question. Yeah, um, George. Yeah. So I really, uh, what I really appreciate in your comics is the w the way you actually an analyze the relation between the students, supervisors, students, postdocs, and so on. So I think it's it's very acute and very uh, very actual. So I was wondering. I mean, are you are you already committed or willing to be committed in any? Uh, I would say, I would say pedagogical, advanced pedagogical. Uh, project. I mean, I mean, you, you would do great, you know, just by, you know, mentoring advisors, for example, or mentoring students, how to deal with their advisor and vice versa. And second part of the question is that, you know, you have, you have the time to think about it, is what would you advise, uh, well, what would you be your advices uh, to students and advisors, you know, how to uh, well, basically make things make research work better, when make relationship, you know, work better, and so on. So I know you can answer the first part. Uh, the first one is, would I be willing uh, to be like a consultant for advisors? Yeah, for example, yeah. Yes, please. <laughs> I mean, you know, you have all this active learning stuff going on for the, 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 the classes, but I mean, uh, you could also imagine, I mean, well, you have this analysis so on this, ex this personal experience and the way to transmit that. So you can uh, actually imagine to uh, develop some active mentoring, for example. I don't know how to call that, but yeah. uh, something. I'm going to guess you're a professor. Sorry? I'm going to guess you're a professor. I am. <laughs> <laughs> no, you know, I, I, one time I gave this talk to like a, a group of all the graduate deans in the country. And they were like, the first question was like, you know, um, so what, what should we, how, do you, how would you make grad student relationships better with their advisors? And my answer was, you know, allow me to do your job for you. <laughs> <laughs> now what I usually tell people is basically, you know, I try to include all my thoughts on that into the presentation. So, uh, you know, I think that equation really kind of sums up for me what that relationship is, you know. 
you know, the advisors can control the flexibility and to some degree the motivation and the, the students can, you know, mostly are in charge of the motivation and they can to some degree control the flexibility. And so that's, that, thinking about that equation, I think, is, I guess, the biggest advice I would give. So that'd be, um, the first box. No, okay. the second one. <laughs> what was the second one? <laughs> well, that's, that's the part where you're supposed to give advices. What's that? That's the part where you're supposed to give advices to us. Oh, oh. <laughs> well, first you have to pay for the first advice <laughs> as a consultant. Uh, no, what, what advice would I give? Well, basically what I tell every, everyone who asks me that question is, like, what, what advice would you give anyone? Um, is to buy my books. <laughs> no, just read the comic strip. I mean, every, every, I guess everything that I feel and, and think about these situations, it's all sort of, I put it all in the comic strip. I have a, I have a question for you. Oh. Mm. Well, last night we were leaving dinner and Jorge was very jet lagged at dinner and was falling asleep. And, so you get to go home and have a good night's rest. And he said, um, yeah, I have to, have to post a comic tonight. And now we can say, well, you don't have to. <laughs> but I'm curious, who gives you deadlines now? Or, I mean, do you, is there an editorial overseer that makes you uh, post a certain number of comics a month or a week? Or how does that work? Uh, no, it's just, it's just kind of a personal goal for me to always try to produce three, three things a week. Right. So that's just kind of my personal goal, and, and I, I, over the years I noticed if I stick to that, then things kind of work out in the end, you know, financially, personally, everything. Um, but you're right, I did say I have to go draw a comic, and, and so what Bernie used to say is that, this professor that I keep quoting, uh, he used to say, you know, we don't really have to do any of these things, but we use that word mainly for social excuses. <laughs> So if I had to say, I don't really want to be here with you guys, I want to be In other words, going. he said, let's get out of here. I'm sick of talking to you guys. <laughs> yeah. Do you have to post a, another comic tonight? Is it? Uh, tomorrow. I have. <laughs> OK. We probably have time for one more question. Uh, I think the one up here. I'm going to ask the second question. Sorry for that. Uh, as much as like, you know, students are usually advised against procrastination, because it might, like, not might, usually the professor tell them it, it's not going to help you with your academic work. It's going to delay you and such and such uh, against your case here, which helped you discover a new hobby and something like that. Do you think actually procrastination might help students in their academic work apart from discovering new things or hobbies? So I think somehow procrastination is good for creative thinking. What is it? For creative thinking. Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, basically, that's kind of what I talked about earlier. <laughs> 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 so I have to give the lecture three times, guys? Not at all. <laughs> uh, no, I mean, I, I talk about these things because, um, yeah, no, I, I really do believe that uh, procrastination is helpful to sort of help you think creatively. And, I mean, the most, it's not really that you have to procrastinate. It's really that um, you don't have to feel guilty about procrastinating or that guilt doesn't really exist or that you make up, you know, the, all this guilt that you feel is not really existing. You know, I think um, if you are stuck in a problem, probably the best thing for you to do is maybe focus on something else for a little bit and then go back to it and, and try it again. Thank you. All right, thank you very much.